Hey, Taylor, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty well. Yourself? I'm doing well. Uh, Ryan is trying to stay warm in his basement. He can say what he wants to say. <laughs> I'm just, uh, I'm over here on um, Teespring and I am making a t-shirt with Taylor's face on it um, for the podcast to monetize it. Nice. I can't wait to get one. I really can't wait to get a shirt with my face on it. $20. (laughs) So I I think that's the appropriate place to to bring up the fact that Taylor and I both uh, are doing some work for Catastrophe Games. I'm going to be doing some videos and and hopefully some games in the future. Taylor has a game coming out this spring uh, called Stonewall Uprising. And we're going to be talking about that game a lot tonight on the podcast uh, as well as what taylor's been playing um so we'll probably start with some levity before we get to that game because that game is a serious game um and on that note i didn't ask you beforehand but are you still going to publish the uh dexterity game with airplanes uh right now the whole shipping prices like the okay okay the, the prices of everything has basically put that on pause I love that game with my heart of hearts, but I I'll, I'll get there. That's that's currently my answer. Okay, okay. What, does it have an official name? Like, because you were under contract for it, right? No. Oh, you no. weren't. Okay. No, that if, if I was with contract with anyone, it was me. Okay. So that's that's a self-imposed timeline, if anything. And and the the title I was going with was the Great Airplane Race. So can 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 I get told what this is? Christopher likes to ask people about games that they know. And then all of us, the listeners, are like, cool. What is it? <laughs> so do, it's, I want to know. I'm my, excited. My understanding, so this is my understanding. Just seeing yeah, your I want pick. Chris to explain it. It's like telephone. This is more funny. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 so let, let's see <laughs> what I get right. it to you. And then, I, and then I'm like, no, no, here's why you're wrong. And then it goes. <laughs> oh, I thought I was going to write the release for the box or the rules. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to spoil Ryan. But now that you mention it, obviously. <laughs> But I might monetize that, so you might, yeah. Uh, I signed it away. I I think it was uh, Rodney from Watch It Played had somebody recently, like, quote him uh, um, on the back of a box and said something like, this is an okay game that I might want to play again. It was like the quote that they used. Yes. Yes. He was like, I, I guess I might have said that at some point because I have played this game. I don't remember saying it, but I, I have a game with a with a back of the box, not too dissimilar to that. It's pretty great. Yeah. So my understanding, and, and then Taylor can correct me, is uh that it, it's just a dexterity game where you have some rules around throwing some airplanes. Uh <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll confirm. It's basically a game about making and folding and throwing paper airplanes. Yeah, that's basically the pitch. Takes ten minutes. Technically, any number of players. Basically, I mean, it's it's pretty wild, fast family game that I I really like, but it's very out of the mold. Like you know, there's not a board. Your your playing piece is a physical piece of paper with grid lines on it, and you're folding symmetrical lines. So it is. Um, it's a bit of an oddity, but I, I honestly love it. Like that is a game that is shockingly fun, even if you're already good at airplanes, because there's some randomness going on in what lines you can fold. So you might have the perfect one in your head, but will it actually play it in real life? That's so there are restrictions about how you can fold the plane if you're gonna get points. Uh well, I, it's it's a it's a one time I win. Like it, the game ends okay. with someone winning. There's no points at all. It's <laughs> I my goal is to keep it very simple and straightforward to keep it the audience as wide as possible Mm -hmm. um and uh the yeah there's restrictions on what you can fold you can't just throw a paper clip at the end or some nonsense like there's some pretty clear concrete rules um but uh it's short and silly and you know it's it's not like a thinky heady game right 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 i score 10 victory points and then i reset (laughs) this point salad um just one clarification i know it's not finalized i I don't know if you guys heard the uproar in the airplane paper airplane community a couple of years ago but a guy broke the world record for the longest indoor airplane thrown however the thrower i believe was a professional 
NFL quarterback. And that caused quite a commotion. Are you allowed to sub in throwers in no. this air? Okay, cool. Not remotely. No, yeah. you have to do it. In fact, I recommend <laughs> in, in the current draft of the rules, I recommend that if you're playing with children and adults, the adults should get on their knees uh, to make sure it's fair. I respect this. Children. And that's funny because uh, the children are going to be the ones reading the rules and they're going to be like, hey, 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 no, no, no. <laughs> It's it's interesting that you have more well-defined rules than the National Paper Airplane Throwing Commission. I well, think that's what I, their name I was. I'm not a member anymore. <laughs> I, I haven't read them myself, but I also, you know, I had to actually play test this and they just did. Uh... <laughs> um, so you're work, working on that. That's going to come out someday. Uh, the one that I'm excited about, and we were hoping to have Joe here with us tonight, but you and Joe Schmidt are working on Sacred Band based on a book you read. Do you want to talk about that book? or? Yeah, I mean, I could talk about the premise uh, of yeah. what's going on. So um, the Sacred Band, uh, the Sacred Band of Thebes, Thebes, the Greek city, not the Egyptian city. I know there were two. A lot of people confuse them. It's fine. It's fine. We've all been there. All of us, probably. Um, <laughs> two Thebes? Or yeah, two, yeah, there okay. was a the, yeah, there's a Thebes yeah. in Egypt, which yeah. most I would say more people are aware of, and the, the Greek Thebes, anyway, semantics. Uh, but the Sacred Band of Thebes was a group of 300 uh, men. 300 was a magic number in ancient Greece, uh, like the Spartans and whatnot. Um, and the odd thing about the Sacred Band of Thebes was the fact that the, they were 150 pairs of male lovers. They weren't just the fighting force. They were also fighting with, you know, their, their partner. And, you know, the idea at the time was that that would make them fight more valiantly and more passionately, not only to impress their lover, but also to make sure they both stayed alive. Right. And um, at the time, it was about um, 370 BC, around there. Um, in Greece, uh, you know, a, lo a lot of... People talk about how how much more um, maybe accepted or or understood homosexuality was then. But at the time, the Spartans weren't so hot on the idea. Mm, Spartan king was not super excited about it. And the, the Athenians, they would allow it, but you were expected to marry a woman. That, that was that was gonna happen. And in Thebes, that was basically the only place where you could live with that kind of partner. And nobody, damn, I mean, people probably cared to some degree, but they cared the least there. And so um, a lot of that has to do with Hercules and Iolus or, or, or what's his name, how Hercules had a male lover himself and he was Theban. So there's, you know, mm -hmm. they, they, their myths go back to that. And they're like, oh, wow. And they have shrines for those people, uh, which is where the sacred band was located at one of those shrines um, where they trained. But it's basically a game about partnership and um, trying to work with one another um, in the heat of battle. You know, you can't you can have a conversation like this. We can talk and, and communicate freely. But when you're in the middle of a combat zone, you can't just sit down and be like, OK, so what we should do. It, no, you need to get inside each other's head in the moment and make it work. And if you can't, that is life or death. So it's a, a two player uh, kind of light deck builder, kind of the mind style co-op where you have imperfect information and you're trying to work together to make it out, to, to do a grand art version currently uh, do whatever the Oracle says. The game's still under work, of course, it's not done. Mm -hmm. Things could change, but uh, we're really liking where it's at. And it, it has, I would say it's a lot more subtle in how queer it is compared to like Stonewall, right? Like, the, like you know, you, you're, you're, the other player's called your partner. Um, uh, that could be anyone, you know. Uh, canonically you're 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 two men of course but mm -hmm. you know the actual players could be anyone i i don't care if, you know you could have any it could just be your best friend it could be anyone um i guess there's a resource thing game called eros uh but what you actually do with that is mechanically not abstract but what you do with it not like you know in the in the actual world the game world is abstracted i mean you know i've had a lot of players talk about what they think they're doing I don't have an answer for him. <laughs> um, what was the, okay. <laughs> this, this is how my brain works. What, what was the uh, Guillermo del Toro movie with, with the giant uh, robots fighting? 
the Pacific, oh, Rim. Pacific Rim. Yeah. Yeah. Pacific Rim. I feel like there was a, a huge missed opportunity now as I hear you talk about this fighting style where they had to like work together. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 That's yeah. a cool idea. <laughs> All right, thought, you're right. Yeah. I should ditch this whole historical game nonsense and I should just make, I should just get GDT on board. You're right. You know, never no, no, mind. No, no. log off. No, I'm going to send an email. Click, click, I click, thought, click, click, click. yeah, I was, I thought that we were talking about the, the band with like yeah. the weight and stuff yeah. i like this idea a lot better i don't like i like lee von helm as a drummer <laughs> and a singer but i i think that this is a lot better idea that you have going no well, it's I, funny it's funny because um joe pitched me the idea months back he was like hey i yeah i've played stonewall i love what you did with it i think this would be a great game for us to work together on and then he's like go read this book and just let me know and then i read it i'm like yeah let's do this man <laughs> So Taylor, what I really like about the game, among other things, is that this is uh, a neglected part of historical war games for for the most part. Like this is a reality, but uh, not just for this time period, but for um, several time periods. I'm sure you know more about than I do, but I can't think of many war games, especially historical war games, that touch the subject at all even if it's part of the subtext of the game so i see you wait do you, when you say that touch it all what are you talking about specifically i, I i'm just saying uh homosexual relationships sure. between between the uh, uh participants and combatants is not something that is um talked about in, in war no. game generally no i i actually uh i don't know six months ago I looked up the LGBTQ like tag on Board Game Geek, and yeah. it is sad. It is abjectly sad. It's just so much like gay exploitation, like like very clearly, I would say. And I was like, "What the heck is this? Come on, man! Like it's ridiculous." Um, but doing research on Stonewall, I felt really opened my eyes to like, "Oh, wow! No one's talked about any of these topics. Did no one?" No. And and I was. Uh, saying the other day on social media, you think it was just a hole in the market, someone would fill it. Like, like uh, you know, a lot of people would. There's a demand, I, I think, pretty obviously. At well, least the response to Stonewall has told me there's a demand. Um, I think a lot of pop culture, like in all things, is kind of like there's a erasure of like pretty much anything that's not what. You, Homosexuality only existed in like the last 30 years, according to a large subset of humanity, like the concept of like sure. it existing in the past. Is there like, no, and people will argue with you about it. And you're like, dude, there's like whole historical con like I've, I've not well researched, but yeah, for it to not exist in board gaming is and then to be exploitive is well, not what's surprising. weird is there are random examples that aren't that might not be as exploitive as you would guess. The the big example, and this blows my mind, is Gayopoly. Gayopoly, you you would expect it to be Monopoly, which is gay stuff, and it kind of is. It is. But what impressed me while while looking into it. Because uh, I looked at, like, there's, like, 20 games on this tag. It's not hard to look at each one kind of for a little bit. But Gay Gayopoly does something where they use the hanky code in the game. Like, that's part of the game. Um, and it's, it's like the cards you get. It's like the chance cards or some such, if I recall correctly. But it's just wild. Because that meant that whoever worked on that game knew about the hanky code and, like, put it into the game. And that's just wild to me. Because the hanky code, for, for those who aren't aware... Um, was uh, a queer youth, gay youth, lesbian youth, et cetera, at the time, um, mainly 60s, 50s, stuff like there, I would say. Um, they would wear hankies when they went to clubs, and that would say what they were looking for, right? So you might wear a pink one if you're looking for another man, as, as an example, right? I, I don't remember all the exacts of the hanky code. It's been a while since I really delved into that. But... I was just shocked because it's not something a lot of people talk about. <laughs> and, and it was in this game like mm -hmm. that, that, awesome. I, that, you, that you would expect. And so I'm like, well, some effort was put into this. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. so strange. It's like a Polari, the, uh, the language from the, uh, 
England from the probably 40s through the 80s, which was a, uh, a subculture language for the gay community. There's a really good short that's mm. actually pretty oh, real is the good word for it called Polari. I believe it's P-O-L-A-R-Y. But it's like the same thing as the hanky code, but in um, the UK mm, where you just you had it was it was a coded a coded language. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's effectively like almost a dead language now, but it was like I think it existed for a while. Yeah, I mean, to my understanding, the hanky code died out just because people could be more open and they wouldn't they wouldn't face the same level of repercussion. Um, but of course, you know, that was a, a slow shift and not just like a sudden you know mm-hmm. pop i mean it's interesting how many games we have about things that people aren't connected to right like uh just post in uh post industrial england and <laughs> britain from like 1750 to 1850 is way overcovered uh in board games but when you stop and think about it, it's like, why? What, 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 what is so interesting about that? It's, it, that isn't exploitative, <laughs> like without getting too, too far into that. Like, like we, we could, we could talk, we could have a whole episode about that. Then we, mean, should, we go ahead. I, yeah. I, I would wager that the simple answer there is just that that's easy to gamify. Yeah. Right. Like, like gamifying a relationship <laughs> between any two, any people really that's kind of that's kind of mushy and and soft and it, it doesn't it doesn't fit into like a box where it's like I need to make money and you're like well well when do people make a lot of money you're like Pfft. so I'm I'm not <laughs> defending that I'm just saying that's probably why because that's yeah. way easier to abstract those systems are already easy to gamify it's just harder you know to to make a good game out of it but saying like oh you you tick this this box up and then you make more you know donuts or whatever. That, that's super easy gamifying a relationship as way harder gamifying all that that's a pain in the booty so here is a, to, to 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 flip it and, and make it as awkward as completely possible have you ever played a game as the bad guy a historical war game as the bad guys taylor well, i mean I'm, i made a game where you can do that so i mean yes <laughs> we're, we're, we're not even there yet yeah but yeah let, let's get there soon but like have you ever played as the nazis or as uh I, I don't know as like i mean i that's the easy one right yeah no i agree maybe so the real secret is i don't play a lot of historical games like a <laughs> lot of games that are like hard like hard I, yeah. I don't tend to play a lot of those which is why a lot of my historical games feel a lot simpler than other historical games because <laughs> i tend to play more economic or like euro e or, or whatever game or family games even um because a lot of those history games are so long it's so long. You know, I definitely have a limit on, I mean, unless it's really like a magical game, you know, mm. um, and there, there's just, there, there's just gotta be a barrier there. Um, so, you know, if it was like the best game ever, yeah, sure. But man, a, a lot of those historical games where you play as, as the bad people simulate such epic conflicts that it's just like, all right, like, okay, I get it. That's cool. You have fun over there. <laughs> When you were playtesting your airplane game, did you have any of the airplane designs based off the Supermax? Um, no, I cannot say that I did. Well, if you did and you played them, maybe you're playing as a bad person. Okay. <laughs> what What are you playing right now, Taylor? What are you enjoying uh, when you say that you like to play more uh, things that capture your attention? We'll put it that way. Sure. I mean, I... I like to think of myself as an omni gamer. I don't know if that's 100% true. Cause again, I have, I have a limit on how long I'm okay with games going, but I'll play all sorts. Um, you know, I man, like the other guy, I got in some, some really great games, Tokyo highway. Oh my gosh. I love that game. Um, and I got to play mind management for the first time. Oh, I'm um, jealous. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I kept hearing really good things and I was like, okay, okay, I'm, I'm going to try this game. I'm going to see how it is. And I played it once. It was just a two player thing. I'd like to play with more. It seems like, it seems like it'd be better with more, but I, I thought that it encapsulated that experience um, probably better than most games. Like I've played letters from white chapel a bit and that game just takes so long. It feels bloated in comparison. Mind and management. Like I think that game really could play in under an hour. 
Um, and that's been one of my biggest issues with those hidden movement kind of games is, you know, they just, they start to just drag. Um, and then, uh, gosh, okay, we played suspend the other day suspend. I, I don't even know if it's on board game geek. It's this weird, it, there's like a metal rod that, that is just like, Oh yeah, uh, yeah. 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 And it's just such a goofy, silly game with like the die. It's not very strategic. It, I don't even know if it's a great game, but it's very fun. And when you're all very giggly at the end of a game night, it's pretty good. It's pretty, it's pretty ace. Um, but, have you uh, played TikTok Woodman? No, I have not played. I, I've heard it called TikTok Lumberjack. Or Lumberjack, but, yeah. Uh, sorry, but I, know, yeah. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. No, I, I wanted to. I mean, th- those wacky dexterity games, man, they just entice me. Because because there's just there's a certain level where you're like, Man, this would suck to make for the first time, but boy, is this enjoyable. <laughs> um, but I mean, yeah, like, and somewhat recently I got in some games of Container. I love Container. That game's hilarious. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you know, all sorts of stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, we're getting close to talking about uh, Stonewall. What deck builders have influenced you, deck builders that, that you enjoy? Um, I would say the biggest inspiration has to be pr- probably SPQF, now known as Fort. People actually know that game is Fort SPQF. Eh. Um, that game really, I felt like, opened up a lot of like, oh, wow, you could, you know, you could really play on these conventions. I mean, I played a lot, I played a lot of Dominion, a lot of Dominion. Um, and I'm very bad at it because I just, I just want to make silly combos. Who needs to win when you could just draw cards? Um, <laughs> That's so okay. So, like on one of our very first episodes, we had this discussion about like is what you're doing for most of Dominion, and is what you're doing in Magic is that even really like a game, or is it just a game mechanic that you are carrying out of deck building, where you're not actually playing much of the game? I mean, that's an interesting question. I think um, I'm not quite sure. I have to think on that. Actually, that's yeah. It's fine if you enjoy it. Like not criticizing well, whether you enjoy it. Or, I mean, or not. I, I haven't yeah. played Dominion in quite a bit, uh, to be honest. Um, and Dang. again, I, I don't win terribly often. I tend to like draw my deck over and over, and like think that's really fun. And then <laughs> my opponents like like whoever built the better engine is just like ah, I win already. And I'm like, yeah, but look how many cards I drew. Oh my gosh, look how efficient that was. Um, <laughs> look, look how I just slowly, systematically dismantle my engine to get points. How rude of you, game. Um, and then and then Fort takes all that and says, no, 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 no. You have to you have to care about each other. And I'm like, what? No, there's other people at the table. What? Where'd you come from? And you. Yep. And. Um, I, I think it, it does all that really well and upends and says, no, no, see all these conventions? They're cool, uh, but you should ignore half of them. And these are the new conventions, and we're going to try this. I mean, conventions is maybe even a strong word. Just like new, bold ideas about like what a, what a deck-building marketplace could be. Um, mm-hmm. And so if I had to pick a game, it'd be that one for sure. I mean, I yeah, I think that game really upended some of, uh, you know, my assumptions, but I, you know, I also like played a prototype years ago and like, I was like, that was like the game I was excited about at that event. And I played it and I was like, Oh my gosh. And I made like a print and play. Like, I love that game. That game's stellar. The, the original SPQ. Yeah. 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 Uh, which I didn't realize until I was, I don't know. I was playing like a civilizations game or something, but that, that is like the Senate, the people, uh what what do you remember what that stands for it, it's what? a it's it's a roman legion thing spqf it, oh, yeah, it's a, spqr it's like glory to the people yeah, of rome or something yeah, like yeah, that yeah. and then grant thought it'd be funny instead of rome would be the force so it's spqf yeah yeah and, yeah yeah, yeah his, his is different but like the, the original is like glory to the senate glory to the people glory yeah it's some yeah, long yeah. i i don't remember <laughs> yeah. but i i remember reading his design diaries and like ha 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 no one's and, and every time i brought it out like that copy they're like what is that i'm like don't just 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 don't don't worry about it don't don't worry and if they got it they think it's funny if they don't they're just confused i respect Uh, that i respect the joke that somebody 
puts he, in there for themselves. He, he he called it, I think in his design diaries, he was like, yeah, this is me being self-indulgent, but, you know, I can only, you know, it's my product, so whatever. Yeah. So on that note, a self-indulgent product. Uh, <laughs> let's go ahead and talk about Stonewall. Um, it, it, but in all, all seriousness, like, so Stonewall, yeah. Ooh, it's gonna it, it's a big game in a lot of ways because how many cards do you have in it oh gosh um how many cards are in stonewall i want to say i mean i, I could probably math that out I, I think it's like 100 ish 120 ish it's not i mean oh okay. it's, a, it's it's a deck builder but at the end of the day i try to keep it pretty tight okay. when it comes to card counts for some reason, I, th- I thought it was closer to 140, 150. So um, I, I don't think it quite is there, but I I could be wrong. I haven't really thought that hard about the exact card number in, in a hot sec. <laughs> um, so how would you explain it? Like setting aside the the setting for a second. Let, let, <laughs> let, let, no, no, no. Like like because I like the things that you're doing mechanically in the game too. Sure. I don't want to play as the man when I play, <laughs> but I like that. Uh, and we'll we'll talk about that, but what what are you doing with the mechanics? Why did you bring the different mechanics? And, I mean, you can use the words to, to describe what the different sections of your board are, but yeah, yeah, yeah. What, um, what's going on there in the game? So, uh, mechanically speaking, Stonewall Uprising is a two player head to head deck builder where um, you are kind of playing three games of tug of war at the same time, um, going all the way or close to the end, there's like a little zone at the end for each player. Um, and it's not inherently balanced on, on either tug of war. It's, it's an, it's a, it starts off asymmetric in the fact that like, it's a little easier for you to tug than it is for, you know, et cetera, um, to where you need to go. And when you get too far to the end, you get some ability and then that, that rope, so to speak, resets. Um, the cards that you do play move up on the track and wind up on your discard the cards that you don't play uh, will let you buy cards. But if you decide to say, I'm done playing cards, your opponent's cards will be doubled in value. It's very spooky. But you'll get a draw the cards um, for every card they play. So, you know, if, if Chris plays three more cards than me, I get to draw three more cards next round. So there's some inherent self-balancing, um, mechanically speaking. I really like the the... the way the market ends up working in it it, it, it plays really well um with bound, I, I i don't know what, what else to call it do you call that something else how you buy the cards how you get card, i mean I, I call it a market i mean it's it's okay. yeah the cards that are remaining in your hand they all value still every card is a value and uh all the cards in your market have a value uh, to buy a cost to buy it's two four six um and uh there are three decades in the game each decade those markets shed and you see new cards and so the cards just always get better, right? They they aren't they are stagnant technically, um, but they're always better than what you have. There's no bad cards in the market; mm-hmm. it's just levels of good. And so you're like, well, do I stop early and then buy this awesome card? But then my opponent has the chance to play these obnoxious plays and could monk me, and who knows, maybe win early. So mm-hmm. it's it's just it, there's like a separate tug of war above the three games of tug of war where you're playing cards back and forth. Cause I'm like other deck builders. I don't just play my whole hand. It goes, I play a card, you play a card, I play a card, you play a card uh, until you either uh, have no more cards or fold. Does yeah. this have a, um, like a, the, the tug of war you're saying kind of similar to uh, twilight struggle where you can have an instant victory on the chart back and forth. So it's right. um. So I've, I've, I've played Twilight Struggle a handful of times, but not a ton. Um, I, I wouldn't quite say it's like that, but if you do meet your win condition, you do instantly win. There's okay. no like sudden death. There's no, th- there yeah. are kind of points for each side, but they are different win conditions. You know, okay, your so points are not my points. They're, they're separate. Gotcha. And there's yeah, no so death con where things blow up or anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just, yeah. Let's go ahead and talk about what those win conditions are because that'll give Ryan more context and also start to get into the setting of the game. Uh, yeah, so there's two sides in Stone Uprising. There's the man and Pride. The man's goal is to detain and then demoralize 10 people from Pride's deck. Any card in, in Pride's deck is a person for reference. It's not just individual people, although they are there as well. 
like Marsha P. Johnson or, you know, there's, t- there's tons of them. Um, and then Pride, Pride's goal is to knock the Overton window down to a to a value and then either roll equal to or above that value with their um, with their Pride dice uh, or have their have their dice at a certain value and then get the Overton window down to that threshold or lower. So they need to change hearts and minds, which is a slow process. It is, is- it is- is Obger fell the uh, the the Supreme Court ruling? One of the people in the case was Ob O B E G. Sorry, Obger Oberg fell. That the case is 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 that the 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 tail end of it historically is moving to the Overton window and the Supreme Court case uh, oh, from sure. like twenty. Why? Well, so the game takes place over three decades in the sixties, seventies, and eighties. Oh, okay, so that is. That is way always, you know, it, gotcha, it is, gotcha. it's, um, I, I realized that my, my initial plan for the game was just to take place from 60 to 69. Cause stone will happen to just 69. So just say that happens. Um, but as it was expanding, I realized I needed, I needed more going on. And I figured that expanding it to the seventies and eighties made a nice three act structure. Um, and let me talk about more of the history without getting too far back, um, because that way you can have all these important influential figures in like Pride's deck um, and they reoccur just like they didn't realize they keep doing things, um, it, you know, into the 80s. And even if for one specific example, that's not the case, their legacy keeps going on. So that still happens. Gotcha. Yeah, I I only know the name because they're they're Cincinnati native, and uh, sure. so that was uh, when when that case came through. That's why I was like, ooh, but I can understand not including sixty years. Yeah, because then you're gonna get to like three hundred cards. Oh man, yeah, I huh. I I don't know. Yeah, do, doing more even more contemporary stuff. You know, th- throwing it that much further back in the past. Let me, um. I, I like to think it gave me a lot more options of what to to look for and what to read um, as source material, um, as opposed to now where things are still developing mm-hmm. and unfolding. It's harder to know how things are going to pan out. Um, so I, I at the end, I wanted to kind of start from at least in America, the beginning of like Stonewall, like boom, it, it started. Right. If that makes sense. Totally, totally. So one of the things that happens in the game is that you have named individuals on the side of pride, but no, uh, really other than the Reagan administration, no named individuals on the side of the man. Why did you go with that design decision? Um, well, for pride side, I thought it was important to show the individuals and, and some of them are really well known. I mean, who doesn't know who Harvey Milk is, right? I mean, you know, come on. Um, and there's a lot of other people, uh, Gilbert Baker, uh, most people probably don't know, but he was a, uh, are using artist in the seventies and eighties and on, but seventies when I'm focusing on for this example, and he designed the pride flag, he designed the original pride flag and, uh, 76, 77, and then he designed the commercial pride flag in, in 78. Um, and you know, most people, they, they don't know who that is. <laughs> They're yeah. not like, oh, man, Gilbert Baker. Oh, man. Um, but, you know, he, he designed countries' flags. I mean, he didn't just do that, but it's it's wild. Um, and so there's, you know, a number of people in Pride's deck. And there's a number of people you start with, like Frank Kameni, um, who who were there from the beginning. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they're there way before Stonewall. And so what happens is these people go with it and and – you know, I want I want players to be like, who's that person? And they play the game and they're like, wow, that that guy was oh, my gosh, that girl's so cool. And they looked them up and they read about them and they're like, whoa, um, the man doesn't get role models. But that's just that's just the end of the story in a lot of ways. I didn't want to give anyone a role model <laughs> for how to be an oppressor. Um, yeah. And so at the end of the day, you know, there are. Uh, influences and if you play the game you'll see the art and you'll be like oh that kind of reminds me of this person or that person and yes the reagan administration's name it's kind of hard to totally leave them out but again it's the administration it wasn't just reagan although not that he helped but you know it was the whole thing um it's not you know 
not just literally him. And so, um, you know, they, they don't get people to look up to in the same way. I'm just, you know, I, I was uninterested in, in, in giving someone who was like, man, you know, I feel this way. I want to look up who this person is and learn more about them and be excited about that. I'm like, no, no, no. If you want to do that, you have to go really far to your way. You had to buy the game and, and see all these positive depictions of pride and then do that. And I'm like, I, I just, yeah, I'm just not going to allow that. I'm not going to let that uh, naturally happen, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason all the verbiage for the man is so negatively coded. First you detain people and then you demoralize them and that's how you win. Yeah. That, that, that shouldn't sound exciting or fun to a lot of people. It should make you feel bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was where did where did you start with your design process besides research for, for this particular game and where do you typically start with the, your design process um well, well typically i think of a really cool idea and then i play test it and learn it's not as clever as i thought it was gonna be <laughs> um that's yeah. that's like that's like 90 plus percent of my designs and most of them are not historical at all mm -hmm. uh stonewall i started the research because i knew that if i made the game in my head it would not resonate with anyone. So first, like you mentioned, I did research um, and it started with just the 60s. And then I slowly started to build out what would end up being the, the tracks, the um, public opinion, um, systemic support and individual support. The three the three kind of tug of war tracks you're pulling on. Mm -hmm. And um, I slowly started hammering out what a mar what a two player deck builder would look like. That, that was really the initial was like, how would you do this and what makes it compelling? Mm -hmm. And very quickly it evolved to um, have, have, have a pretty cool core, but it just felt kind of samey um, where, yeah, I started with like, okay, what makes, what makes turns exciting? What could make this go risky? And that's how I came with the folding system and the doubling system and all that stuff. And then I was like, well, you need to be able to buy cards to deck building game. How do you buy cards? Oh, the leftover cards. That feels natural. And so it all kind of, it all fell into place troublingly quickly at first. <laughs> um, and yeah, so the, the core of it was just trying to play around with a two-player deck builder. I can't really think of many. I'm sure there's probably some, but I knew I couldn't just like say like Dominion, but you, just, you and you, it doesn't work. You need to have time to respond and react. And that was pretty obvious from the get-go. Um, so that's, that's more or less where I started. The hardest part was making sure that the theme was naturally integrated. Cause I knew that if that wasn't there from the get go, from the very first play test, people would say, yeah, that's cool. But what does this have to do with Stonewall? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why I did a bunch of research at first. That's why I made sure to really do some homework and look into it. You know, cool. I couldn't just like paste the pride flag on every card or some nonsense. It's not going to work. So, so you call it Stonewall Uprising? I know Kuala I can never say Kuala Kuala. A lot of people say, "Well, why you got to show me up like that, God, man?" No, but trying um, to help. <laughs> but you know, I know, I know that there's a lot of uh, weight. Weight's the not the correct, uh, but you know, uh, for for the term for the word riot, um, I I don't have a problem with it. Um, uh, but then again, I, I, I may not know a reason why there's a problem with it, but you chose uprising for the title, um, as opposed to, which I, I think commonly, um, or at least in my exposure to it has been called the Stonewall riots. Um, I assume with your research, you found that uprising was a better term. Why is that? Yeah. So while researching it, and this is pretty early on, actually, um, I learned, that more and more recent is pretty contemporary to be honest, but more and more recently um, the, the term it's not that the term riots bad. In fact, there's a, there's a, a card in the game called the white night riots and that's what it's called because they were the white night riots. I mean, that's what they were, but more and more because of its significance and, and, and gay and queer history, Stonewall has been viewed less and less as a singular riot and more as a larger uprising. Um, and so that that's my understanding. Um, and I, I, I will concede that when I say Stonewall to a lot of people, Stonewall riots definitely resonates more immediately. But I think that will shift in time. I think 
there's a lot of content in media that teaches about these events and people will will come to learn you know oh yeah it's just a stone uprising that's what it was um it's not any inherent negative bias toward the word riot there were lots of riots especially around that time over all sorts of things um and there still are today it's not some you know i'm not <laughs> not i'm not i'm not against using the word riot i guess but um but i thought uprising was the better term um based on the research that i did no that makes total sense and it it resonated with me when you're like it because it it was more than just that it was the 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 forward movement of or the yeah yeah it galvanized <laughs> a lot it was yeah. a pretty big deal i was gonna say the forward movement of the movement yeah but i can't even say colloquially <laughs> <laughs> so uh Anything else you want to say about this game? I know you're going to be talking about it a lot in the coming months as it gets ready for crowdfunding and all that. Uh, I'm not even going to poke the bear uh, on that topic right now. Uh, I'm not allowed gosh. to do that. Oh, geez, I want to ballpark. You can, you can when, do it, Ryan. I'm going to. When, I'm when, gonna... when am I? When am I? When am I signing up for the notification uh, launch? <laughs> oh, that's fine. That's that, that's not poking the bear. That's not what I'm talking about. Taylor yeah, knows I, what I'm talking I about. Think, I think you can do that now. I think you might be able to sign up for that now. Um, if you really want to, if you really want to make sure you hear about the game, um, I am sure that if you follow me on Twitter or catastrophe games on Twitter, you'll hear about it. I will not be quiet about it. I have a hard time being quiet about anything. Actually. It's a problem. <laughs> I don't think it's a problem. Um, so yeah. So is there anything else you want to, you want to say about the game or you're hoping to have it at origins this summer, right? Yeah, yeah. I think the plan is to kickstart in April, I think, mm -hmm. or crowdfund in April or whatever that ends up being, and and then uh, end up with it at Origins um, because Catastrophe does print on demand locally with Blue Panther. Um, in theory, they should have it ready by June, uh, which would be wild. Having it ready for Pride Month just sounds awesome. <laughs> um, oh, man. Origins Pride yeah, is exactly. great. Is yeah, like yeah, yeah. Cincinnati's Pride is... I. I whatever like i used to... <laughs> anyway I, yeah. I was in a lot of cincinnati's prides for a long time they moved it downtown it was all right sure. it, it's bad it's cool i like it columbus pride is it, you know they say yeah. cincinnati's 10 years behind on everything you go to cincinnati pride you go to columbus pride it's two different worlds sure. columbus pride people are having fun well that, that's that's <laughs> one of the ideas yeah is, is i know when i told yeah but when I when I tell people about that and, and all that, like their eyes perk up and like, what do you mean there's a game? But what and who, you know, and who's in it? Like, man. So I, I definitely think that, yeah, for, for Origins and all that, that'll be very exciting to see reactions. Um, and they're like, I could beat the man like bop, 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 you know, playing this game or whatever. <laughs> so because uh, it does yeah. play solo, too, right? Yes, there is a solo mode uh, where you just play as Pride. And uh, the man Ottawa or bot or whatever we're calling it um, is is a separate thing, not played by a person, just a single player experience. Which I think that will appeal to a lot of people too. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. I I I tend to for playing with someone, but I can totally respect either a not having that person or b not feeling comfortable with either of you playing as that. And so that's why the bot's there, is so that you can play a one or two player. Um, and, and I mean. Uh, Every solo game is playable cooperatively too. So if you want to play with somebody, you could work together to beat the the man, right? Uh, you could, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't <laughs> mind making myself uncomfortable for lessons. I mean, I, I think that, that playing as the man, this is probably the note I'd, I'd want to add, Chris, is playing yeah, the man yeah. is designed on some level to make that player more uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, I, I think that's hard to grok until you play it, but a lot of people who play it have told me, have, have, have echoed that exact sentiment where a lot of times they feel very uncomfortable. I've even heard players feeling nauseous afterwards, just like it hitting them, you know, in a very emotional way mm -hmm. that I, I don't think a lot of games do. Um, and by having a player embody that role while uncomfortable, you know, they experience some things that they maybe wish um, hadn't happened ever. <laughs> Yeah. Which is, is, you know, it'd be nice, but it, that's history. It actually happened, you know, however awful. 
Well, I look forward to playing this because I, uh, I, I think that the, the goal of using games to teach people about history is like one of the purest, coolest things that people can do with gaming. And then if you can also make it a compelling and good game and not just like hitting somebody with a ruler, telling them to pay attention, I don't mind playing winning as the man and feeling bad for it. You know, maybe, but I say that now, but afterwards I'd be like, that was the worst one of my life, you know? Um, but like, I've been, I've played games. I've, I've had that experience with some more educational games and, and yeah, like, I don't know. It's, I feel uncomfortable all the time. So like, you know, I, I don't know. I, I I'm excited for this, especially since it will be available in June ish ballpark for pride. Columbus Pride. Do you, at Columbus, the parade usually falls on Origins weekend, or it I've has heard, historically yeah. for like the twenty years that I went there. So yeah, we'll see with with COVID and all that where that actually lands. But that'd be pretty great. Yeah. yeah. Oh, don't worry, it's Ohio. So <laughs> yeah, it's open, <laughs> open, <laughs> open it up. <laughs> oh goodness, uh, Taylor, thanks so much for being with us tonight. We we won't take up more of your time so that you can you can get going. <laughs> I mean, you've been talking a lot. I mean, if if you want to share any any more about anything or anything you're looking forward to in gaming, whether other people's games or anything, we can end on that. Uh, I know you've been talking a lot about narrative, at least on Twitter, narrative in games and wanting to see things that actually tell a story better. Um, Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not even just about a narrative or a story. Um, Something I've been thinking about a lot lately in general is is just you know what kinds of games what games give players an emotional connection what games make players care about something especially yeah i think it's not impossible very difficult uh to care about something that was constructed in the game one of the hacks that i get to use in stonewall is that you are a person and to win you have to do these terrible things right like you have to so you feel bad you know you you feel bad um with the AI, it's not quite the same with the bot because it's the bot. You're like, God, screw this bot. Um, but having having a player care about something that the game came up with um, that they actually like, not not that they hate, although that, that could also happen. It's just so rare. I can think of so few games where I actually cared about, you know, a character that they like I actually cared or I actually got upset when something happened to them. It's so hard to do. And all the examples that I can think of are like video games because you know they can really walk with you and have that like narrative, especially a lot of modern ones like a, like the recent God of War and Last of Us Two. Like I thought those did it really well. Um, but I mean, how many board games can you think of like that? You know, oh, I sold my grapes for ten gold. Great, <laughs> great. Um, the camel, and, that, and that's more what I was talking about the choices thing <laughs> earlier. Yeah, yeah. Go the ahead. Camel, camel. The camel, yeah. the camel with the panda in Jaipur. Oh my There's gosh. one camel with yeah. a little with a little panda. I have an emotional attachment to that okay. one. Okay. <laughs> so. Oh goodness. Um, <laughs> thanks. Thank you, Taylor. Appreciate your time. No problem. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, we'll we'll talk again. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing more oh. of what you do. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It was good to see you, Taylor. Yeah.